Okay, hello everyone. Welcome back to the lecture series on advanced machine learning. And as usual, we start with a recap. Right now we are discussing one of the most interesting architectures in deep neural networks that have come up during the past few years only, and which is extremely successful. And that is the so-called transformer architecture, which is based on the attention mechanism that we have discussed already previously. So I want to start my recap by saying how does a transformer work in principle? So the idea is that you're still dealing with something like a sequence, for example, a sequence of words, or maybe more generally some collection of objects, which may be ordered in a sequence or maybe not. And you want to process this. And it's a variable size data set. So you don't know how many objects you're going to process. So you cannot use your usual standard uh, neural network architecture. And so you don't want to use a recurrent network. You also don't use a graph neural network. You only use the attention mechanism. And the image displayed here on the screen displays the concept. So you have a set of objects. And each of these objects is allowed to formulate a query, which is then matched against all the keys of all the other objects. And then afterwards, each of these other objects contributes a value. And we take the weighted sum of all these values according to how good was the match between the query and the key. And that is the answer that is being fed back to the original object that formulated the query. But now every object gets a chance to formulate a query. And so it's really an all to all coupling, a little bit different than what you have, say, in a graph neural network where you would only have a few nearest neighbors to which you talk. Here it's really all to all. And you're using the attention mechanism that we discussed. So match between query and key tells you how much attention you should pay and how big is the contribution of that particular value to the overall answer that an object receives. So that's the idea. And then that answer is being used to update each and every object on its own, independently of all the others. So you get a set of objects, which is the same number of objects, but they are all being modified. And then you can do this again and again and again. And so in this way, you can process this arbitrary size set of objects, a little bit similar to how a graph neural network can process an arbitrary size graph. Okay. And so when you start looking into the details, it's not very difficult. You just have to keep track of a couple of indices. For example, here I call J the index of the object that sends out the query. Eventually, this will be all objects that are there. And J prime will always be the index of the other object that receives the query and tries to match it to its key. And then L is just a vector component because all the queries, keys, and values, they are vectors. And so what, when we are first being handed these objects, each of the objects has its own data vector. So DJL, that's my notation here, DJL would be the component L of the data vector of object J. And then out of these data vectors, you first produce the query and you produce the keys and you produce the values. They all result from the data vectors simply by linearly projecting these data vectors in different ways. So in other words, mathematically speaking, you take the data vectors and you multiply them by matrices and these matrices can be learnable. So that's the purpose here of the um, W, the matrix here, which uh, only acts on the vector dimensions. So it only has indices L and L prime. It does not depend on the index of the object because it's the same projection, the same linear transformation applied to any object. And then you produce the corresponding query vector of object number J. And likewise, you can do this for producing key vectors for each, a key vector for each object, and also a value vector for each object. And so these will be the vectors that our attention mechanism then works with. 
So now you apply the attention mechanism. So given queries, keys, and values, um, you match the query against the key for each pair of objects, J and J prime. You calculate an attention score and you raise this into an exponent and if effectively you apply the softmax operation. So you get a normalized probability distribution that tells you how big is the contribution from each of the objects to this particular weighted sum. So W is encoding the object in a way. Um, yeah, so W is the linear transformation that takes the existing data vector and you multiply this matrix W onto it and you get a new vector, which is the query. And you can imagine that, for example, the data vector has a um, has a higher dimensionality than the query vector and the W matrix uh, would do that. It would do the step from the higher dimensional data vector to the lower dimensional query vector, for example. Yeah. And in a sense, it's encoding. You can also say this. So for example, if someone provides you in the original data set data vectors that are one hot encoded, so there's only a single one and or the rest is zero, depending on different classes of the object or different attributes, uh, then this W really can encode the one hot vectors that are quite lengthy, can encode them into vectors with continuous components. Yeah. OK. OK, and so now you use the attention mechanism to calculate the attention weights and you use the attention weights to take the weighted sum of all the values. So you range over all objects J prime. You look at what is the attention weight connecting J prime to J and that's the weight and you sum over all J prime and that gives you what is the value vector, the new value vector for object number J. And again, there's always a detailed way to write up these things with all the indices present. Or if you want to have a shortcut formulation, you can write it in this manner. And this is what you will see in the original paper. But then someone needs to tell you exactly, um, for example, the softmax is over the second component and this uh, multiplication there, how should it be treated? Okay, and now what do you do with that? Well. This is something like an answer that a given object receives an answer based on its query from all the other objects. And now it wants to do something with it. And you could immediately try to update the data vector in the object with this answer. But it is even better if you apply an arbitrary neural network to that answer. And so this is very similar to graph neural networks where you collect information from all the neighbors in that case. And then you have another update network that processes this uh, collected information and is used to update the data inside the node of the graph. Or here in this case, we update the data inside an object. So uh, v, v prime was the result of our attention mechanism and you stick it inside a neural network and out comes the new data that is now being stored inside the object. And that completes one round of the calculation. So everything I've described right now, so the attention, so first generation of query keys and values from the original data, and then the attention mechanism, the weighted sum, and then finally this post-processing, so to speak, with this neural network, which is independently applied to each object. All of this is one round of processing in a transformer. It's sometimes called a transformer block or a transformer layer. And overall, you updated your objects from data D to D prime. And mathematically speaking, D is a matrix because it has two indices, the vector index and the object index. And now the strategy is simple, right? Now you can do this multiple times and hope that by doing it multiple times, uh, you have a more powerful architecture, just as whatever we did before for all the different architectures we can do the same here. OK, and so to sum up the situation at present, you would say the input to your transformer block is n objects. Each of them really mathematically is just a single vector represented by a vector. You map them onto queries, keys, and values using the linear mapping. You apply the attention mechanism. You do your weighted sum. You run it through the neural network, processing all the objects now independently, all of them processed by the same neural network, and that 
results in new data vectors, but it's the same number of objects. And then you can repeat this again and again, as I just said. Now, if you do this multiple times, this really has the structure of a multi-layer, eventually deep network. And there are some known issues with training deep networks. You can easily get stuck if you don't pay attention. But over the years, even coming from the visual processing field, uh, people have uh, discovered interesting ways to uh, make training more successful in such situations. And uh, two of the tricks are now being used here in the transformer. One of the tricks is so-called residual connections. This is still something we discussed last time. So uh, that means instead of a network layer calculating the new neuron values directly, so f of x is what the network layer does, and then you get a result. Instead of that, you add this result to the old value. And so what you are computing with your neural network layer is not a complete step to a new result, but only a change in the vector. And that makes things a little bit more robust because you can think that maybe initially things are initialized such that the F is rather small. So it's almost the identity transformation. So at least nothing bad happens. Okay, so that's residual connections. And they were the first trick that people used in image processing networks, deep image processing networks to go to many, many layers. And then the second trick is to make sure that the typical values of your neuron activations are not growing very much or shrinking very much. They are always in some reasonable range. And this is done uh, using so-called layer normalization. So what you simply do is you take the vector of neuron activations, you calculate the average, you subtract this average, and you calculate the variance and you divide by the spread, the sigma, the square root of the variance. So as that everything is always around average zero and of order one. Okay, and so taking both of these together, you can do whatever you did before that I already described, but do it in a slightly smarter way. So you do the residual part where you take the outcome of your operation, like for example, the outcome of the attention operation, the weighted sum, and you add that to the previous vector, and you also apply the layer norm. And likewise, when you then furthermore apply the neural network to the result of what you had done so far, um, again, you add the previous values and you apply the layer norm. And so we can summarize all of that. Here in a slightly modified structure, which is now really how a transformer works, or at least the most important part of the transformer works. Uh, you send in your data objects, you um, produce various keys and values, apply the attention, but then you add to that the old values and you do the layer normalization. And then you do the neural network processing, but again, you add the old values and do the layer normalization. And so that's more robust if you want to train a deeper architecture. Okay, so that's the point where we left off last time. And let me see um, what I want to discuss next. Yeah, so the first thing I want to discuss is now something that uh, we already anticipated a little bit when we discussed the differentiable neural computer. At one point, I mentioned very briefly that uh, instead of having only one read operation and maybe one write operation in each cycle or each layer, it is sometimes convenient to have multiple read operations and multiple write operations. And these are so-called read or write heads. And the same is true here. So we can also do this here. We can have multiple heads. which just means the following. We have now multiple queries that are formulated and also multiple keys and multiple values that are being generated. So the Q is the query, J is the object, um, L is the, is the index, and then there might be another index here that 
is the index for the head. So there will be multiple heads now. I range this from one to some age. And then you would take the old data and project it using some matrices onto new query vectors. And these matrices now depend on the head. And what's going to happen here is that maybe one head, uh, I don't know, formulates a query that uh, asks for the color of other objects and another head asks for the shape of other objects. And all of these things can now happen in a single step as opposed to being sequential in different, different steps. And you can do the same, of course, for the keys and the values. So um, for the head number one, for example, which is concentrating on the colors, the query is the color that we want to query, that we want to look for. And the keys are projected in a way that they have extracted from the full data vector only the information about the color. And then there's head number two, and it does something else. And so what we will get is then, again, we will apply the attention mechanism. But now we will apply this separately to each head. So separately to the query vectors for head number i and the corresponding key and value vectors. And that would give rise to somehow the new value, you could call it, for head number i. Now the question is, now you've got several designs. So one, two, three, four, five. What do you do with them? And I guess there are multiple way, ways to deal with them. And the most expensive uh, approach, you could take all of these separate vectors generated by the separate heads and stick them all inside a neural network and then hope for an interesting result to emerge. But uh, one design principle of these transformers is that uh, you do not make the individual steps computationally more expensive than they absolutely have to be, because <laughs> you will be running this over billions of examples, so you need to be efficient. And so what people proposed is then that you just concatenate these vectors. So for each head, you get a vector. You just make a longer vector where you concatenate these vectors. So you would say V prime is the overall result, is so to speak the result of multi-head attention. Let us write it like this. And that would be just the concatenation of the output vectors. And so with concatenation, I mean um, all these, if you follow uh, closely, of course, the Q and the V and so on, they are in principle matrices, but the first index is always the object index. And when I say concatenation, I just mean concatenating along the second index, that is the vector index here. Um, so we don't mix and match different objects, we just concatenate along the vector index. And then for good measure, you take all of this, which is now a longer vector, and you still project it somehow linearly. And the typical notation here is, again, you multiply with some proper matrix. And this matrix, if you pay attention to the dimensions, will be of this uh, form. Uh, the concatenated vector has the dimension h, that is the number of heads times the um, times the um, value dimension, which is here assumed to be the same for each of the heads. And then what it should produce is a vector of the dimensionality that is the original dimensionality of the value vector. So uh, that's the dimensionality of the model. And so that is uh, how we treat the results of multiple heads. And so just to give you an example, in the original transformer paper, what they proposed was um, eight heads and a D model dimension of 512. So that's the size of the data vectors. For each object, you have a 512 dimensional vector. And then the keys and the values were designed to be 64 dimensional, which is just the if you distribute the 512 on these eight heads. And the, this seemed to be a good balance so that the computational effort doesn't become too large. 
Okay, anyway, so this is just an example. So that would be multiple heads. And then there's another thing which we haven't discussed so far. So this other thing is right now, if we look at things, this is just a bag of objects. It's a set of objects. And no one knows if these objects are words, where in the sentence the objects are sitting. So the location of these objects in a sequence is unclear. It's at least at present not encoded in the objects. And so this is obviously something important, at least if you do sequence processing using this architecture. And so the question is then, how do you encode the position of a word in a sentence? And I guess there are multiple ways, some smarter and some not so smart. If your sentences or your text would always have a, a fixed size, I guess you could have a one hot encoding that that is an additional part of the vector that puts a one at the position inside the sentence where this particular word is located. That could work, but uh, then uh, your total length is limited. You could also presumably uh, have the numerical value of the index of the word in the sentence encoded. So for example, it's word number seven. So maybe uh, there is an additional value added to the data vector that just holds seven or some something that is rescaled maybe. But people came up with a much smarter way and this is what I want to discuss now. So how to encode position. So one of the things you could always do is to have this learned, yeah? So you could say, um, I add to my key or I add to my data vector something that is a function of the position and is being produced by a neural network. Something like a key vector or a part of a key vector is an um, is a function, is a neural network function of the position. However, again, this is extra effort and it would be good to have a, maybe a fixed way to encode the position that does not represent so much computational effort. And so here the idea is quite nice. The idea is, remember in the end, we will match queries against keys by a scalar product, by a dot product between two, two vectors. And what this dot product tells us is basically what is the angle between two vectors. So there would be a query vector here, and there would be a key vector there. And basically, by looking at a scalar product, we are measuring the angle. Now, it could be smart if we somehow encode the position into a key vector in such a way that it is compatible with this scalar product idea. And the way to do this is to say, I encode my, sorry, I encode my positions as an angle themselves. So we could draw a circle and we would say that whatever is at the top of the circle is maybe position number zero, if you like. And then the, um, or maybe to keep the usual notation in, in mathematics, zero is here. And then you would increase the angle as the position increases. And then the encoding would be a unit vector that is oriented at the right angle where the angle is proportional to the position. And then if you want to search for a word at a particular position, if that is somehow important, uh, then you would, or the neural network would construct a query vector that, that points along this direction that corresponds to this position. So that could be an idea. So how would this, um, how would this look like? Well, we could say the key or a part of the key vector or a part of the data vector is just cosine of 
the position for this key, for the object that we want to encode. And in addition, maybe, because we are talking about vectors here in a two-dimensional space, also encoding the sign of the position. Okay, so JK is the position of the particular object for which K will be the key. Now, you see I left some space open because the question is how should you scale this? What should be the scale factor that translates a position, which is a discrete number, one, two, three, four, five, into an angle? Well, we don't know at the moment, and we can give a name to this number, let's call it omega, because it's a little bit something like a frequency. If you think of J like a time, time of the word occurring in a sequence, then omega is like something like a frequency. And then if you wanted to query for a word sitting at this position, uh, you would formulate a query vector. If you can do this by hand, you would formulate it, um, you would formulate it likewise. So now let's see how that works out. We would, uh, when we apply our attention mechanism, always encounter scalar product. So Q times K, what is this? Well, they are both unit vectors. So it's just the cosine of the angle. And the cosine of the angle between them is of course, the cosine of omega JQ minus JK. Okay. That looks good because if JQ equals J, K, if they match, then the cosine, it's the cosine of zero, so it's maximum. And so you would have something like this. If I plot now the value of this Q times K scalar product versus the position of the object JK, then I will see that I get a maximum exactly at JQ, which is the position inside the query. That's a part of a cosine function. So here it would be one. So that looks promising. The only question is, how should you choose omega? And that's a little bit tricky. Because if you choose omega very large, then you will get rapid oscillations. So this plot now here would look like that. And yes, you get one when the query matches the key, when the positions match, but you also get one at many different locations and maybe you don't like that. On the other hand, if omega is small, then the situation improves a little bit in that aspect. Now you have a very slow cosine, but unfortunately that also means there's not much of a difference now between the results that you get when you perfectly match the position and the results that you get when you're a little bit off. And so the question is, what do we do? Now the answer suggested in that transformer paper is do everything, try all possible omegas, so instead of just encoding this for one particular fixed choice of omega, provide such two-dimensional unit vectors for all kinds of omegas. So uh, what does that mean? Well, what that means is the, um, for example, the key vector that you generate when you try to do your position encoding, it has, just like before, it has cosine and sine components. And now to make things a little bit easier, the cosine components, they will have a superscript C here and the sine components an S. And the cosine components are just cosine of some omega L. Now there will be different omega Ls times the J, the position that I encode, and likewise the sine components. But now you see there's an extra index here, the L that I called, because anyway, our keys 
uh, the vectors, the data vectors that we are uh, using anyway, they are long vectors. They need not be just two-dimensional vectors as assumed here. So I can stitch together all the results of cosine and sine for different choices of omega. So the overall that produces a long vector uh, that encodes the position by calculating cosine and sine for different omegas. And now if you do this and do the same kind of thing for a query vector, what's the result of doing the scalar product now? Well, now we uh, get what we got previously, but we additionally sum over all the possible frequencies. So we have a sum over all omega L, cosine, and then the difference of the query position and the key position. And so now that is much smarter. For example, just to give you an example, we could use something that you know if you have ever studied Fourier transform. So something like equally spaced frequencies. So L would range from some zero, one, two, up to some maximum. And J max is something like a maximum position that we can encode. It would, um, yeah, it would correspond to a maximum position that we can encode. So um, you have a very fine grid of equally spaced frequencies. If you then calculate what I put up here, so the scalar product Q times K, and you plot the result against the position JK, you will find that you almost all the time get zero because all the cosine that you add up, they add up to zero because they come with different positive and negative signs. And only if JK equals precisely JQ, the query position, uh, then you will get a large contribution because then all the cosines uh, will add up. So this is what would happen for equally spaced frequencies. But that's actually not the choice in the original uh, transformer, although it would be a possible choice. And the reason presumably is that um, here you have to choose in advance what is the maximum position and also position difference that you can encode. And what that means is you would get a periodic function that then again would produce a peak. And then again, you would have another peak and so on. And that's not so nice. That's not something you want to do. And so what they did in the transformer paper for encoding the position is even more clever. So again, you have a set of frequencies but you don't choose them equally spaced. Instead, you choose what could be called a logarithmic scale. So um, let me describe this. So it's easiest to draw this. If I draw on the real axis all the possible frequencies that we should now look at, we take a very large frequency and then a smaller frequency and smaller and smaller, but the spacings are not equal. You get more and more resolution of frequencies as they become smaller, until of course there is a very smallest frequency because you, don't, you cannot store infinitely many frequency components, so at some point you have to stop. And so um, what this will do, um, before I write down the formula, what this will do effectively is you have high frequencies available. So they are very good for distinguishing on shortened distances, but you also have many very small frequencies available, which are very good to distinguish positions at long distances. And so it's a very good compromise. And so the actual formula that is being used is actually, you, um, you define some minimum frequency and you take it to some power. So the power is some L divided by uh, some, let's call it again, J max, and uh, two times L is smaller uh, or equal than J max. And so now if L ranges one, two, three, four, five, and so on, omega looks like what I drew here. So it's on this logarithmic scale. Okay. <clears throat> 
And so that's what they are doing. And I can show you um, what is the outcome of the scalar product between key and value in this case. Remember that if we had equally spaced frequencies, we would have a kind of delta peak only sitting at one spot. Now, if we have this logarithmic scale of frequencies and we add up all the cosine of omega times the position difference, what we get is no longer a delta peak, but we still get a fairly sharp peak. So if I didn't make a mistake in the calculation, this is what you get if you add all of them up. And so what you see is that still you have a relatively good uh, resolution um, at small position differences. So what I'm plotting here is the difference between the uh, position of the object that is being queried and the position that is encoded in the query. And you see that this uh, changes very rapidly at small position differences. So you can very well resolve small position differences, but it also still encodes reasonably well large position differences. So it does everything. And then there is a final funny remark. Um, when they apply this to language tasks, they just take the data vector that encoded the original word, let's say, and they compute um, these cosine and sine contributions and they just add them. They just add them to the data vector. They overlay them onto the data vector. But you could also put them somehow separately in a separate component of the vector. Okay. And so this is now finally the actual um, transformer architecture that is able to process a sentence, for example, because the words are the objects. Each word also gets this position encoding that is added on top in the beginning. And then afterwards, it's what we described. Yeah, afterwards, it's up to the transformer architecture itself to understand what this position encoding really means and to use it uh, together with all the other data that is encoded. Okay. So, so far, so good. So now we have found a way to process the words in a sentence using an attention mechanism that can pay attention to words that are arbitrarily far apart and that in each layer processes them in a new way. So what could happen now, for example, is there's a word that is a noun and the noun wants to know whether there is any adjective that uh, describes the noun nearby. And then it would send out a query to all the other words asking them, are you an adjective? And also it would maybe encode in this qu query its own position and ask the question, are you an adjective that is relatively close by because then maybe you are an adjective that is describing my attributes. So that's good. Still, this is not the end of the story. And it's not the end of the story because uh, at least for the original transformer paper, the motivation was language translation. And so if you want to do language translation, you need one part that somehow receives the original sentence that's the part we now described. But you also need another part that can produce a new sentence in the target language. And so while the part that we have now described is called the encoder that encodes the original sentence, uh, the part we will describe next is called the decoder that can produce a sentence. But before I go there, maybe if there's any question, you feel free to ask. If not, ah, yeah. Aha. Isn't positional encoding really an engineering hack, different approaches for different use cases? Um, you could say so. Um, certainly, so first of all, there can be other use cases where you don't even need a position encoding and then you drop this part. Second, um, if you have a use case where the, um, where, for example, you have a two-dimensional position, maybe something more physics-oriented. Maybe then you want to have you want to try different position uh, encoding. At least they tried whether different ways of doing position encoding 
gave very different answers. So uh, they had also a learned encoding uh, as opposed to here this fixed uh, encoding with a cosine and sine. And they say that it didn't give really different performance. Um, you have to somehow uh, put in position information, I guess. Yeah, so that's all I can say. Oh, ah, yeah, one could probably also put in information in a more relational manner, similar to graphs. So you could maybe uh, put in uh, into the data vector of each object information um, about properties of objects that are nearby or words that are nearby. And then presumably this could already be enough also to reconstruct from this context uh, where you are sitting in the bigger sequence. Okay, so now uh, just uh, briefly, if we really want to do this full translation task or sequence to sequence task, as it is called more generally, then we need both an encoder and a decoder. So the encoder is what we described, but the output of the encoder is now supposed to be used as some kind of additional input to a decoder. I say additional input because the way the decoder really works is the following. And it's similar to what people had done previously with uh, recurrent neural networks when they wanted to generate sentences. So what you do is the objective of this piece of the architecture is the following. You already assume you have already produced a few words of the sentence and you ask yourself, what should be the next word? So the purpose of this part of the decoder part now will be to produce a probability distribution over possible next words. And then you sample from this probability distribution. So it's a long list of words, each assigned a probability and you sample and you pick some word with a large probability and that becomes the new word. And then the sentence has become longer. And again, you look at this longer sentence and based on that, you again predict the next word and so on and so on. So now the, I have described what should be the output of this step. So the output is a list of word probabilities. So that's the output. But what's the input? Well, there are two pieces of the input. There's one piece of the input, which are all the words that have previously been generated in this attempt to produce a new sentence. So initially there's zero words, but then there's one, two, three, and so on. So that are all the previous words in the target language. So that's, so to speak, the set of objects that is input to the decoder. But then later on, what also has to enter, obviously, is the sentence in the original language, or rather, it's already pre-processed version that has been pre-processed by the encoder. And we will now see how both of that happens. So first, you take your set of objects that represent all the words that are beginning to form the new sentence. You take them, you add the positional information as usual, you get your attention, and this is now the usual self-attention, the same kind of attention we have discussed in the encoder, so that, um, uh, that you are processing, you're starting to process the sentence. And then as a next step, you feed the end result of these N layers of the encoder, the end result of that, is being fed into the decoder architecture. This is what comes in here. And it's feeding, it is feeding into both the keys and the values, because that is now supposed to be a database kind of that you can query. But the query itself, of course, that doesn't come from the old sentence. The query comes from the new sentence because the query is basically something where you're trying out what could be the next word in the new sentence and you are having some questions. So you ask, okay, now I want to place a noun at this position in the sentence in the target language. Please, in the original sentence, can you tell me which nouns were present in the sentence? So the query is being produced based on the partial sentence that has so far been constructed. And the keys and the values, they come from the encoded sentence. 
And then you have this um, attention going on. So um, keys and values provided from the old sentence, query being provided from the new sentence. And that helps to um, change the change the set of objects in the decoder. And then you apply the neural network as usual. And then you do this repeatedly in many layers. In each layer, you have the first part, which is self-attention. And the second part is uh, attention between the decoder, which produces the queries, and the encoder, um, encoder data structure that has already been produced. So the decoder pays attention to the encoded uh, sentence. OK. And that's it, basically, after, after going going through this uh, multiple cycles. Um, uh, finally, you just put maybe just a linear layer on top of that uh, to map the result, the data vector in one of these uh, objects to a large vector that represents all the probabilities for the next word. And then you sample from these probabilities. And then there is a tiny detail that you will find mentioned in the literature. And that has to do with the self-attention here. Yeah. So what, um, what's going on usually is that the um, that in principle you have here already the additional objects for the words that you have not yet generated, the words that only will be generated in the future. And you must make sure that you don't pay attention to those because they are not yet available, so to speak. You can only pay attention and process all the words that have already been generated. And this is uh, the purpose of a masking layer. So that's another little engineering detail. You put in a mask so that you don't pay attention to any words that, uh, or any objects that represent words that have not yet been generated. OK. Okay, so that's it. That's the whole architecture. Encoder, decoder, self-attention, and cross-attention, so to speak, from decoder to encoder. And then all the little details that, like this mask or the position information. Well, so is there some question at this point? Otherwise, I would uh, go right to examples. Okay, so you can still ask questions later. Let me go to examples. I will start first with examples from the original paper, and then we go to more sophisticated examples. So uh, this is one example from the original paper where they investigated the attention. That's the first question you want to ask, right? So here you have some sentence, let's say that's in the source language. And this is the self-attention that's going on in the encoder. And they particularly picked one of the words, let's say here, the word making. And they ask in a particular layer of the encoder transformer pipeline, in a particular layer, which other words in the same sentence does this particular word pay attention to? So this is the word making produces the query, and the other words are being matched against this query. And this is even shown for different heads. So the different colors and the different lines will now represent different heads. And the more intense the color, the more uh, the bigger the attention weight. And so what you can see here is that um, it was a sentence about making the registration or the voting process more difficult. And apparently, all at least all these queries connected the word making with the words more difficult and that makes some sense yeah so these words sit in a very different piece of the sentence they are not immediately neighbors but they belong to the making so you make blah 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 more difficult so that's that goes along with the making here's another example so here's a sentence about the law blah 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 and then there's the word it's and now, again, the question is, 
which other words does this particular word pay attention to? So it's would provide a query. And then it seems that it's provide, uh, it's uh, turns its attention to two words, namely the law and the application. And that makes a lot of sense because it's the application of the law. So the it's connects the application to the law. And so here you see the kind of long distance relationships that are correctly being modeled by this attention mechanism, which are notoriously hard for other approaches. Um, for example, if you wanted to do recurrent neural networks, that's a difficult thing to do, especially if the distances get even longer, uh, but using a transformer, this works. And so this is the original paper. Now, we want to zoom out a little bit because then I want to show you many more examples of how it's being used nowadays. You see, this is from 2017. So a few years have passed. Um, and still, at first, we stay within the domain of language transformers. So language processing, because that's the original application, long sequences of words. And there are multiple ways to train them. So uh, one way to train things, apart from this translation that we just discussed, is you can also do just language modeling. So you can give incomplete sentences and you can say, predict me the next word or predict the probabilities of the next word, given all the previous words in the sentence and maybe also the previous sentence. Or maybe you can do word masking so you say, I give you a sentence, but I mask a few of the words. I don't reveal them. Can you please tell me what you think is the most likely word at this position? Or you can say something like, I have a sentence and I present you with, say, two possible sentences that might be the next sentence in a longer text following this one. Which one do you think? is more likely to follow the original sentence. And so there are many different training tasks of the sort that you can invent. And if you then run your training on a sufficiently large database that contains billions or millions of words and sentences, and you always train on this task, comparing against the truth, the, the real words and sentences in the database, then your model gets better and better. And so then what are some of the tasks that you can apply those models to? Um, again, natural language processing is a very old field. Um, and one class of task is language understanding, which is often tested by telling a story or giving, a, say, news text from the news, a short news story, and then asking questions about it. For example, asking a question of, which color was the car? And so then you have to relate that to someone saying you in the story what color the car was. You can have more generally question answering, uh, by which I mean here even uh, question answering even without giving a story. So after having read everything in, say, Wikipedia, maybe your language model can answer quite arbitrary questions about the world. You can have text generation as a uh, very generic task. So that would mean you start a few sentences and then you hope that the model continues these sentences into some coherent story that would make some sense. Or you can try text classification. So you give some story and then you ask, okay, is this a detective story or is this a comedy and so on. Now the question is, if you train on very large data sets, then often these data sets like Wikipedia were not designed specifically for this task. And so how do you deal with this? And one way to deal with that is to take your pre-trained transformer model, which is trained on this very big data set, and then put on top of that, what you could call a task specific network that you can train. And just to give you, an example of this. So let's say you have trained a big transformer model 
on very large database, say by masking words. And so it has gotten an understanding of how typical sentences uh, look like and how what words mean and so on. All of this, it has gotten some internal understanding. And now you want to train it on classify, on classifying texts. But of course, the classification is some task that you invented. So this was not a task present in the big data set. So uh, you have to do something on top. And so what people can do is the following. So they can feed the sentence, any kind of sentence or any kind of story inside this transformer. Then it does what it has always done for any kind of other task, uh, especially for the training tasks where it was trained on completing text and it transforms it somehow. Um, and then in this particular application, you give it just some indication that it should come up with something that encodes, tries to encode some of the sentence or the story as a whole. But it still doesn't know about your classification task. And then what you can do is you take the vector that is being stored in this particular object at the end of this part, and you feed it into a fully connected network. That's a network that you set up, which initially is not trained at all. But you have some training data set, which teaches you how these stories, how the original text should be classified. For example, emails, they can be classified as spam or no spam or unclear or something like this. And so then the first thing you can do is you just run the big language model transformer on your, on your training database. It produces an encoding that uh, is not yet specific to your task, but then you feed this encoding into the classification network and you get some output. And initially it of course will not be the correct output. And then you um, can uh, punish or reward it according to whether this was the correct output. So it becomes the usual supervised learning. So that's what you do initially. And then you can become even more sophisticated and you, you can say, well, um, apart from training this classification network on top of my pre-trained transformer model, I can also now take a few of the layers of the transformer model and fine tune them in order to maybe even further improve my classification accuracy. And typically people do uh, just take the last few layers of this transformer model and uh, let the training pipeline also change these weights by gradient descent. And so overall, then you started from something that could be trained on a really big database. And then you put something on top for your particular task, and then you fine tuned in the end. So this is something that people do. But there is something which is even more fascinating, namely tasks where you don't even need to train for the particular task, where you just use the transformer that has been pre-trained and don't do anything extra. And so this is what I want to discuss now. And that can be done simply by training on language modeling, so text generation. So suppose you have a transformer that is structured a little bit uh, like the decoder type transformer uh, that is, it has self-attention, it has masked self-attention, and its purpose in life is to predict the probability of the next word. So for example, here, the sentence that is being fed in, it says, in physics, we study, and then the output of this big model after training would be a list of the probabilities of different words. And since it has started to understand what these sentences mean, it will correctly predict that it's more likely that the next word will be something like particle or field or wave, but not lungs, something like cars or fruits. So you train this simply on a big, big database, simply by, um, asking it to predict the probability correctly of the next word. And now something quite amazing happens. So you have trained this. It's basically trying to complete your sentences. And now you can feed in the description of a task simply as plain text 
by giving, for example, a few examples of what you wanted to do. And from these examples, it starts to understand what it is that you wanted to do. And then afterwards, it can actually do it. So um, this was first pointed out in this very nice paper about language models being few short learners. So a few short learner means you don't have a large training data set on which you train by gradient descent, uh, but you only have, um, say, a description of the task, maybe a few examples, and then afterwards it can immediately have a good performance. And so this is one example. So what they provided is everything in gray is input to the model and everything in black is output of the model. So at first they give us input, uh, description of an imaginary word here, the what poo. And then they say an example of a sentence that uses this word is, and then they give an example of a sentence that uses the word. So this is something that they entered. And then they repeat this kind of description to indicate to the model that they now want to go on doing this kind of game. So again, they describe an imaginary word, and then they say again, an example of a sentence that uses this word, blah, blah, is, but then they stop and they ask the transformer model to complete what can come next. And the funny thing is just by having looked at this single example, the transformer model has understood what is the game that it's playing, supposed to be playing now. And it produces a reasonable sentence uh, that uses this new word, which really makes sense. And then they give other examples where they describe a uh, imaginary word for a vegetable. And then um, uh, it makes up a sentence that describes how it had a trip to Africa and found this vegetable uh, growing in a garden. And so that's, that's amazing. And once you have understood this, of course, you can, you can do this in many different examples. So here's another example that they uh, proposed. Um, here they give some context. Again, this is what they feed in. And this context looks like the beginning of a book of poems. And then they um, say always, there's a poem by, with a certain name uh, by a certain person. And then because they didn't want to write this poem, they say text omitted, which is something you might find somewhere on the internet maybe. And then again, some name of a poem and uh, a name and text omitted and so on. And then I give, they give another example of a title. They have the name of the author, which apparently is a real author. And then they ask the transformer to generate text. And it really starts to generate poems and if you believe them, these are poems in the style of this particular author. So just by having invented this fantasy beginning of a book of poems, they can query it to produce actual poems in a particular style. And again, in earlier days, one would have trained a model specifically on generating poems, maybe after having been pre-trained on large uh, databases. But now one doesn't need to train anything. So this is just prompted by a query. And so by now this has spread everywhere. And one thing that people are using this for nowadays is program generation. So if you put programs on GitHub, you can sign up for a project that's called the GitHub Copilot. And uh, what this does for you is you start writing a program and then you write a comment that describes what you think this routine should do. For example, here it says parse some list of expenses, uh, produce, some, uh, produce some method that will be able to parse these strings and then do something with them. And then the uh, generated part is highlighted here, it's the lower part. And it really starts to write something that makes sense. For example, in the explanation it said, that you should ignore lines starting with uh, this um, hash mark. And indeed, it starts a program uh, that would ignore this particular mark. Okay, so this is um, 
really fascinating, I think. And that's all um, text generation. Now, there's one word I want to make. It's about um, the size of these models. So one of the first models uh, that came basically from Google, because uh, it's also a team from Google uh, who wrote the ori original transformer paper. Uh, one early model was called BERT. It was trained on Wikipedia with billions of words. And it had, if you counted the number of trainable parameters inside its neural networks and all these matrices W and so on that we talked about, it had about 300 million parameters. And of course, as you imagine, this amount of training data, this amount of parameters, that's quite an effort to train. And then the race was on and other companies here, OpenAI, started to also train their models, for example, on 500 billion words and had eventually GPT-3, you may have heard of it, a model with 175 billion parameters. And of course that um, raises questions. So the uh, amount of effort to train them is really significant. I mean, just also the financial resources and the power consumption. And then um, these models are extremely powerful. I gave you a few examples that also produces some potential problems if you abuse these models. And for example, OpenAI GPT-3 is not even, so it's not out there as an open source source code uh, with the model parameters, but you can uh, register for a program where you have access to their API and then you would send queries and then you would get back answers from the server, which is probably reasonable because they uh, have a more efficient way of running their server. Uh, so all of this is computationally intensive. Okay, so this is uh, language processing. Of course, you can do more. Here's uh, still a funny example, um, also from OpenAI, that is image generation from text prompts. This kind of thing has been done previously using recurrent neural networks. Now it's even more powerful using the transformers. Here, uh, you can play around on their website. I chose a penguin made of cabbage, and then it produces <laughs> lots of images of penguins made of cabbage. So that's still the uh, fun. But then there is an extremely remarkable result. So um, in the whole field of science, if you were to ask nowadays, what is the most amazing scientific breakthrough enabled by machine learning in the natural sciences, then people would probably point you to this particular paper. And so that's a paper from the company DeepMind uh, about protein structure prediction. And that's a notoriously difficult problem. So the, the setting of the problem is easy to understand. Uh, you have a genetic sequence that codes for a certain sequence of amino acids that make up a protein, which is a, just a very, very long molecule. But then this protein will fold into some complicated structure if it is inside the actual cell. And the question is, how does it fold? And you would think maybe you can figure this out using a physics or chemistry simulation, but it's really difficult because um, it's such a big molecule. It depends very much on the sol uh, solvent, the water that is surrounding it. Um, and there are long range interactions between different parts of the molecule and uh, the folding process itself. If you were to try to simulate it microscopically, you have to also simulate all the detailed microscopic vibrations of all the parts of the molecule. So it's really a mess. It's a really, really, really complicated problem. And so there are even competitions that people have run in the past where the idea is everyone can enter with their particular technique to predict protein structures. And many of these techniques look at databases of existing proteins where people know how they fold, and then you try to predict what's going on. And um, this is a very hard problem. It's a very important problem. And the reason why transformers play an important role in the solution here is that if you look at protein structure, you find that if you look at the building blocks of a protein here, uh, just depicted at little, as little blocks, then what can happen is that two building blocks that in the sequence are very far apart, for example, this one and that one, uh, 
actually they can come close together when the protein folds up because maybe one is positively charged, the other is negatively charged. They pull each other together. And that's important. For example, if now there's a mutation in the genetic sequence and one of them changes, then probably also the other will change. So all of this is very important, but these are long range dependencies. So if you are only given the sequence, these are long range dependencies. And immediately based on what we said, you see there's a sequence, there's long range dependencies. So maybe transformers can help. And indeed this is what happened. So they, as a very important building block, they have what they call the Evo former. So some version, some variety of a transformer that uses the attention mechanism where basically one piece of the protein sequence uh, can pay attention to another piece and then uh, do this in many, many different steps, always updating it in the way that we described. And eventually you arrive at some predictions for, for example, what are the pairwise distances of the different pieces of the molecule. And then this is finally turned by yet another neural network uh, and including some physics input into a 3D structure. And then these 3D structures will be compared against the training data. So first you train on uh, genetic uh, sequences and the uh, known structures. And then in the real competition, this will be evaluated against uh, proteins that have never before been known. They have just been solved. The structure is known, but only to a few people, not to these people writing these programs. And there, uh, this uh, alpha fold two architecture was way better than any other architecture before and actually has apparently already helped to solve actual scientific questions. Yeah. So, uh, well, I'm sure there will be prizes down the line. And so this is an example of a transformer architecture that has already made a breakthrough in science. Um, if you look into this paper, which I encourage you to, it consists of many different pieces. So that comes back to your previous question about engineering. Yes, there was a lot of engineering, which makes some sense. You want to bring in some domain knowledge, for example, the pairwise distances, they are being forced to uh, be self-consistent so that they can actually describe an actual 3D structure. Because if you have arbitrary pairwise distances, maybe they would not even be fitting to a 3D structure. There are many different pieces that enter here. But you have to say that um, all the people previously entering these contexts, they also brought in a lot of domain knowledge and they were not able to reach this precision. So the precision of the uh, location of atoms in the structure reduced from three angstroms down to less than one angstrom. And that is extremely significant. Yeah, so this is, this is amazing. Okay, so that's protein structure prediction. Um, as for, if you're interested in physics, uh, the jury is a little bit still out. I've seen, for example, a paper that tries to do dynamics prediction because if recurrent neural networks can be used to predict dynamics, a transformer maybe can also be used to predict dynamics. It's still to be seen how, how much this buys us. What I found nice is something about symbolic mathematics. So uh, some pieces of symbolic mathematics are kind of deterministic. So for example, if you want to take the derivative of a symbolic expression, that just is a fixed algorithm and there's nothing to learn there. But if you want to go the opposite direction and you start from a symbolic expression and you want to find the integral or you want to solve a differential equation symbolically, that's actually extremely difficult. So humans do this by trying an ansatz or for integration, they have different tricky methods. One method works for this kind of expression and another for that kind of expression. And so what these people here did was they took uh, many, many training examples of symbolic expressions. So for example, the expression that um, some symbolic expression randomly generated, and then what's the derivative. And then they train a transformer model to take in the derivative and to guess what was the original expression. And in that way, you can take the integral, so to speak. And so they did this on many randomly generated examples and were able to find a relatively nice performance. So here the examples shown seem to be ones where Mathematica or Maple 
uh, are not as good in finding um, or they cannot even find a solution. So I found that interesting. Okay, so that's it about transformers. Uh, any questions about transformers? Very exciting area and very powerful. And if you look at it in detail, it's not that difficult a structure, yeah? So there is the self-attention mechanism and that's it. Okay, maybe you're a bit overwhelmed, but um, have a look at it and let me know if you have any questions also in the, in the discussion group. If, aha, uh -huh, there's a question. Aha, uh -huh. is self-attention then the reason it is more useful in other areas than language, for example, vision task? Yeah, so there are also, I haven't mentioned this here, but there are also transformers for solving vision tasks, and they also profit from the attention mechanism. So basically, trans whenever transformers are successful, it is due to the attention mechanism, because basically they are nothing, nothing much more than the attention mechanism. And so it's these long range dependencies that they can attend to. So uh, in vision, uh, this means presumably they can pay better attention to the global structure, the larger scale structure of uh, some object. For example, the, the original convolutional neural network that is still a part of the solution will pay attention and understand, oh, this is a, I don't know, this is a face and that is a part of a car, uh, but the transformer presumably is then able to, uh, to, to pull together these different pieces of information that are residing in different pieces of the image and make something useful out of them. Yeah. It, it makes some sense to me because um, after you have used the original convolutional neural network layers, um, to say deduce different objects or let's say parts of objects and different pieces of the image, what you then have essentially conceptually is a set of objects. And so what's the best way to go forward to deal with the set of objects? Well, it's a transformer. So that's how I view it. Okay, very good. So now I want to finish the transformer and the attention. And I will want still to remain within this larger chapter where I discuss more advanced neural network architectures. And so there's a one very recent development, even more novel than the transformer, and that goes by the name of implicit layers. And I wanted to discuss this at least briefly because uh, not only is it a, a novel and a seemingly quite powerful mechanism, but also um, it has a lot to do with physics and differential equations and equation solving in general. So I, I thought it would be interesting to you. Okay, so what's the basic idea behind implicit layers? And we won't get very far today, but what's the basic idea? So the basic idea is this. So if you have an arbitrary neural network layer or building block of a more complicated neural network, you can visualize it in this way. You have some input. Uh, you run it through this layer. Maybe the layer somehow represents a function. Let's call it capital F. And you get some output. And then, of course, you could have further such steps in your pipeline, but we only look at this one. And so we would say, aha, uh -huh, Z, the output is some function of the input. And theta is all the parameters inside this function. And this function could now, of course, be your fully connected network, convolutional network, residual network, transformer, graph network, blah, 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 and so on. But in all these cases, the um, function was given kind of explicitly. So we invented the structure of the fully connected network. We invented the structure of the convolutional network, of the transformer, and so on. We know exactly which computational steps are being made inside there and how the parameters enter. Now we want to do something slightly different. 
We want to say that this F becomes an arbitrary operation of a more general type. Like for example, F tries to solve an equation that contains X or it tries to solve a differential equation or it tries to solve an optimization problem. So it's a more general task that F solves. And the big interesting idea behind deep implicit layers is that even for such more general tasks, um, you can make it such that you can take the gradients through these tasks in a way. So let us write this down. Um, F is some general operation. Like for example, um, find the solution of an equation that depends on X. And the solution would be labeled Z. Or it could be a differential equation where again, um, X enters, for example, as an initial condition or as a parameter or something like this. Or you would want to solve an optimization problem where again, X enters maybe as a parameter. And so on. And now this is all good and fine because there are numerical techniques to solve an equation or a differential equation and so on. So it's not so hard to go from X to Z. But the problem is in the end to be able to train this whole as part of a bigger architecture, we need to take gradients. We need to be able to take the gradient of Z with respect to the input X. And how are we going to do that if we were to use some black box numerical routine to, for example, get the solution of a differential equation. And so that's the important question. And so I want to start by discussing uh, as the first example, equation solving. So um, let's pretend we have some arbitrary function G that depends on both Z and X. And I want to find a solution Z at fixed X. So that's the equation I want to solve. And we can uh, represent this graphically. Uh, if X and Z are both one dimensional and G is also one dimensional, we could have a situation where this is the curve where G is actually equal to zero in this two dimensional plane. And then if I fix X, so I pick some X, then for example, this would be the solution Z. And if I change X, I will get another solution. So now you see how this can become a building block of a neural network, at least in principle, if we are able to solve this gradient problem, because um, we map an input X to an output Z, but now it's defined implicitly as the solution of an equation. That's why it's called implicit layer. Okay, so now uh, for the purposes of the discussion, I will call this particular solution Z for the given X, I will call that Z star, which is now a function of X. If I change X, I get always a different solution. And this will be, the solution Z star will be the result, the output of my layer. So the solution is the output. Okay, so good. So the question now, um, the question that we have now is, if I wanted to do gradient descent or backpropagation, I need the derivative of Z star, the output with respect to X. So that's something I need. 
And the question is how to get those because we haven't got these derivatives explicitly. I, I mean, I have G, presumably this is given somehow, maybe in the form of a neural network or maybe in some other form. Presumably I can take derivatives of G with respect to Z and X, but now I wanted to take um, the derivative of the solution with respect to X. And so the question is how to do this. So there are ways to do this. The, there is a naive way, which I would briefly mention. So um, the numerical solver, the algorithm that finds such a solution of such an equation, usually uh, will reside in some library uh, that you call, but you could try to implement the solver yourself and you could write it in a way that it is actually part of a computational pipeline in a framework like TensorFlow or PyTorch. So that would automatically mean that your solution algorithm, that your solver, um, that you can take gradients through your solver. So if you write your solver yourself, you can take a gradient through your solver. Now, unfortunately, this is not so smart because when you do this, what happens is that in order to be able to do these gradients through the solving algorithm, through the solver, it has to store all the intermediate results. So it becomes quite memory intensive and it becomes also quite slow if it has to keep track of everything in order to be able to take derivatives. So that's not so smart. Okay, so that's the naive way. It would work and it does work, but it's slow and memory intensive. And so the, um, the better way to proceed here is to use um, a little smart result from mathematics, um, which, is, which goes under the name of implicit function theorem. So um, if we have a situation like this, where Z is only defined implicitly as a solution of this equation, then what this tells us is that at least locally, the solution can indeed be represented as a kind of function like here and under reasonable conditions, if G is differentiable and so on, at least locally, this will also be differentiable. So here we would have, again, this plane of X and Z, and here the curve along which G equals zero, which was our equation. And now um, the function we're talking about is exactly this kind of function. And that would even work if you have a more complicated situation where maybe it's uh, multi-valued, maybe you have something like, uh, maybe you have something like this, that could also be the solution of such an equation. Um, then uh, you have a little bit of a hard time to define such a Z star of X everywhere, but at least you could, for example, define a Z star of X here for the upper part and another branch, so to speak, for the lower part. So it's all good. And now with respect to the derivative, well, it's almost clear from the geometry what should happen, namely, um, if you tell me what's the derivative of G uh, with respect to the both X and Z, that means essentially you know what is the gradient of G. And uh, as you know, the gradient of G is perpendicular to the contour lines. Um, and so that means the tangent here, the slope that we are looking for, the slope of Z star of X versus X, uh, can be immediately obtained. And so we can also write this um, explicitly, and maybe that's the last thing I write. So imagine that I insert the true solution into my function. So this is obviously zero for all X, or at least X in some interval. 
uh, because I always pick the solution and by definition that makes it zero. And what I can now do is I take the derivative of this full equation with respect to X. And again, X could be a scalar, but X, X could also be a vector. Then all of this has to be interpreted in terms of vectors and matrices. And then the result will be the following. So the derivative with respect to X of all of this will act on two pieces, uh, namely the two arguments that G has. The second piece where X appears explicitly and the first piece where X appears implicitly because it's part of Z. And so if I apply D over DX to the full equation, I get two pieces. I get DG over DZ, that's the derivative with respect to the first argument and then DZ star over DX plus the second piece is just dg over dx, and the whole thing must be zero. And again, in principle, these would be matrices. So um, this would be the Jacobian of um, g if g is a vector with respect to z. z is also a vector. That's the first argument. And then again, this would be also a matrix, the derivative of z star, which may be a vector with respect to the vector x. Uh, and I'm not writing this down explicitly, but you could write down the individual components uh, uh, if you're uncertain. And I should also say that sometimes I put the Z star of X explicitly, like in the second piece, whereas if I write DG over DZ, what I meant is derivative with respect to the first argument. And then later you would have to insert into this argument the particular value Z star of X. Okay, so these are small details. Okay, and so now you have an equation and I think I stopped there for today, but you can immediately see that by bringing a DG over DX uh, to the right-hand side and taking the matrix inverse, eventually you have a direct expression for DZ star over DX. And if everything is scalar, then forget about the matrices that I told you about, uh, then you can do it immediately. And you get the formula that you may even for the scalar case have learned in high school uh, how to write down the derivative uh, uh, the derivative of uh, this kind of function. Okay, that was a lot for today. So uh, next time I will quickly finish the implicit um, layers. And then uh, we can move on essentially to reinforcement learning. Okay, very good. Ah, there was still a question about the transformer. Mm -hmm. Yes, let me go back to the architecture. So in the decoder encoder slide, the process is deterministic until the final step. When the next word is chosen based on the probability distribution, is it correct? Yes, that's absolutely correct. Everything and this architecture is completely deterministic. Only in the last step, we, we take a random word out of this probability distribution. So it's that piece of the concept is extremely similar to what people had done before with a recurrent neural network. So you feed in all the previous words into the recurrent neural network. It predicts a table of probabilities and then you sample from this table. Um, if you're interested, uh, this behavior is also called also, also called an autoregressive uh, generator in the sense that, um, so the auto refers to, you're just looking at whatever you have generated yourself. And based on that, you're predicting the probabilities for the next step. And then you're using that and you go on, on and on. So there's, there's no external input going on. So you are producing everything yourself. Okay, good, very good. Any other question? Well, I don't see at the moment. So um, let's meet again next Monday then. And until then, have a good time.